In 1704, a Scottish sailor called Alexander Selkirk was put ashore on an uninhabited island in the South Pacific. For five years, he lived there all alone before he was rescued. And when he got back to England, his story aroused a great deal of interest. At that time, Daniel Defoe was a poor and hard-working journalist and political pamphleteer. The story of Alexander Selkirk the idea of a man brought face to face with the basic problems of keeping himself alive in strange surroundings and entirely on his own fascinated Defoe and inspired him to write his first story. Robinson Crusoe was born in York in 1632. As a boy, he wanted to go to sea, but his father wouldn't allow it. So when he was 19, Crusoe ran away to try the sailor's life. After a number of adventures, he settled down back on land in South America, running a plantation in Brazil. Some of his neighboring farmers had the idea of sending a ship across the Atlantic to West Africa to get Negro slaves to work on their farms. They asked Crusoe to make the journey for them. He agreed, and he set sail on the 1st of September, 1659. But after only a few days of the voyage, a great storm blew up and carried the ship northwards out of control into the area of the Caribbean. In this distress, the wind still blowing very hard, one of our men early in the morning cried out, Land! And we had no sooner ran out of the cabin to look out in hopes of seeing whereabouts in the world we were, but the ship struck upon a sand, and in a moment, her motion being so stopped, the sea broke over her in such a manner that we expected we should all have perished, and we were immediately driven into our close quarters to shelter us from the very foam and spray of the sea. It is not easy for anyone who has not been in the like condition to describe or conceive the consternation of men in such circumstances. We knew nothing where we were or upon what land it was we were driven, whether an island or the main, whether inhabited or not inhabited. And as the rage of the wind was still great, though rather less than at first, we could not so much as hope to have the ship hold many minutes without breaking in pieces, unless the winds by a kind of miracle should turn immediately about. In a word, we sat looking one upon another and expecting death every moment and every man acting accordingly as preparing for another world, for there was little or nothing more for us to do in this. In this distress, the mate of our vessel lays hold of the boat, and with the help of the rest of the men, they got her slung over the ship's side, and getting all into her, let go, and committed ourselves, being eleven in number, to God's mercy and the wild sea. For though the storm was abated considerably, yet the sea went dreadful high upon the shore. And now our case was very dismal indeed, for we all saw plainly that the sea went so high that the boat could not live and that we should be inevitably drowned. However, we committed our souls to God in the most earnest manner, and the wind driving us towards the shore, we hastened our destruction with our own hands, pulling as well as we could towards land. What the shore was, whether rock or sand, whether steep or shoal, we knew not, the only hope that could rationally give us the least shadow of expectation was if we might happen into some bay or gulf or the mouth of some river where by great chance we might have run our boat in or got under the lee of the land and perhaps made smooth water. But there was nothing of this appeared. But as we made nearer and nearer the shore, the land looked more frightful than the sea. After we had rowed, or rather driven, about a league and a half as we reckoned it, a raging wave, mountain-like, came rolling astern of us and plainly bade us expect the coup de grace. In a word, it took us with such a fury that it overset the boat at once, and separating us, as well from the boat as from one another, gave us not time hardly to say, Oh God, for we were all swallowed up in a moment. Nothing can describe the confusion of thought which I felt when I sunk into the waters. For though I swam very well, yet I could not deliver myself from the wave so as to draw breath, till that wave, having driven me, or rather carried me, a vast way on towards the shore, and having spent itself, went back and left me upon the land almost dry, but half dead with the water I took in. 
I had so much presence of mind, as well as breath left, that seeing myself nearer the mainland than I expected, I got upon my feet and endeavoured to make on towards the land as fast as I could before another wave should return and take me up again. But I soon found it was impossible to avoid it, for I saw the sea come after me as high as a great hill, and as furious as an enemy, which I had no means or strength to contend with. My business was to hold my breath and raise myself upon the water if I could, and so, by swimming to preserve my breath and piloting myself towards the shore if possible, my greatest concern now being that the sea, as it would carry me a great way towards the shore when it came on, might not carry me back again with it when it gave back towards the sea. The wave that came upon me again buried me at once twenty or thirty feet deep in its own body and I could feel myself carried with a mighty force and swiftness towards the shore a very great way. But I held my breath and assisted myself to swim still forward with all my might. I was ready to burst with holding my breath, when, as I felt myself rising up, so to my immediate relief, I found my head and hands shoot out above the surface of the water. And though it was not two seconds of time that I could keep myself so, Yet it relieved me greatly, gave me breath and new courage. I was covered again with water a good while, but not so long but I held it out. And finding the water had spent itself and began to return, I struck forward against the return of the waves and felt ground again with my feet. I stood still a few moments to recover breath until the water went from me, and then took to my heels and ran with what strength I had farther towards the shore. But neither would this deliver me from the fury of the sea, which came pouring in after me again. And twice more I was lifted up by the waves and carried forwards as before, the shore being very flat. I was now landed and safe on shore, and began to look up and thank God that my life was saved in a case wherein there was some minutes before scarce any room to hope. I walked about on the shore, lifting up my hands, and my whole being, as I may say, wrapped up in the contemplation of my deliverance, making a thousand gestures and motions which I cannot describe, reflecting upon all my comrades that were drowned, and that there should not be one soul saved but myself. For, as for them, I never saw them afterwards, or any sign of them, except three of their hats, one cap, and two shoes that were not fellows. When darkness came, Crusoe climbed a tree, and he spent the night there because he was afraid of being attacked by wild animals or savages. In the morning, the storm had died down and Crusoe's ship lay grounded a quarter of a mile from the shore. I resolved, if possible, to get to the ship. So I pulled off my clothes, for the weather was hot to extremity, and took the water. But when I came to the ship, my difficulty was still greater to know how to get on board, for as she lay aground and high out of the water, there was nothing within my reach to lay hold of. I swam round her twice, and the second time I spied a small piece of a rope which I wondered I did not see at first, hang down by the forechain so low as that with great difficulty I got hold of it, and by the help of that rope got up into the forecastle of the ship. Here I found that the ship was bulged and had a great deal of water in her hold, but that she lay so on the side of a bank of hard sand, or rather earth, that her stern lay lifted up upon the bank and her head low almost to the water. By this means all her quarter was free, and all that was in that part was dry. For you may be sure my first work was to search and see what was spoiled and what was free. And first I found that all the ship's provisions were dry and untouched by the water. And being very well disposed to eat, I went to the bread room and filled my pockets with biscuits, and ate it as I went about other things, for I had no time to lose. I also found some rum in the great cabin, of which I took a large dram and which I had indeed need enough of to spirit me for what was before me. Now I wanted nothing but a boat to furnish myself with many things which I foresaw would be very necessary to me. It was in vain to sit still and wish for what was not to be had, 
and this extremity roused my application. We had several spare yards, and two or three large spars of wood, and a spare topmast or two in the ship. I resolved to fall to work with these, and flung as many of them overboard as I could manage for their weight, tying every one with a rope that they might not drive away. When this was done, I went down the ship's side, and pulling them to me, I tied four of them fast together at both ends as well as I could in the form of a raft and laying two or three short pieces of plank upon them crossways, I found I could walk upon it very well, but that it was not able to bear any great weight, the pieces being too light. So I went to work, and with the carpenter's saw, I cut a spare topmast into three lengths, and added them to my raft, with a great deal of labour and pains. But hope of furnishing myself with necessaries encouraged me to go beyond what I should have been able to have done upon another occasion. My raft was now strong enough to bear any reasonable weight. My next care was what to load it with, and how to preserve what I laid upon it from the surf of the sea, but I was not long considering this. I first laid all the planks or boards upon it that I could get, and having considered well what I most wanted, I first got three of the seamen's chests, which I'd broken open and emptied, and lowered them down upon my raft. The first of these I filled with provisions, bread, rice, three Dutch cheeses, five pieces of dried goat's flesh, which we lived much upon, and a little remainder of European corn. While I was doing this, I found the tide beginning to flow, though very calm, and I had the mortification to see my coat, shirt and waistcoat, which I had left on shore upon the sand, swim away. As for my breeches, which were only linen and open need, I swam on board in them. However, this put me upon rummaging for clothes, of which I found enough, but took no more than I wanted for present use, for I had other things which my eye was more upon, as first tools to work with on shore. And it was after long searching that I found out the carpenter's chest, which was indeed a very useful prize to me, and much more valuable than a shiploading of gold would have been at that time. I got it down to my raft, even whole as it was, without losing time to look into it, for I knew in general what it contained. My next care was for some ammunition and arms. There were two very good fowling pieces in the great cabin, and two pistols. These I secured first, with some powder horns, and a small bag of shot, and two old rusty swords. I knew there were three barrels of powder in the ship, but knew not where our gunner had stowed them. But with much search I found them, two of them dry and good. The third had taken water. Those two I got to my raft with the arms. And now I thought myself pretty well freighted, and began to think how I should get to shore with them, having neither sail, oar, or rudder, and the least capful of wind would have overset all my navigation. I had three encouragements. One, a smooth, calm sea. Two, the tide rising and setting in to the shore. Three, what little wind there was, blew me towards the land. And thus, having found two or three broken oars belonging to the boat, and besides the tools which were in the chest, I found two saws, an axe, and a hammer, and with this cargo I put to sea. view the country, and seek a proper place for my habitation, and where to stow my goods to secure them from whatever might happen. Where I was, I yet knew not, whether on the continent or on an island, whether inhabited or not inhabited, whether in danger of wild beasts or not. There was a hill, not above a mile from me, which rose up very steep and high, and which seemed to overtop some other hills, which lay as in a ridge from it, northward. I took out one of the fowling pieces and one of the pistols and a horn of powder. And thus armed, I travelled for discovery up to the top of that hill, where, after I had with great labour and difficulty got to the top, I saw my fate to my great affliction, that I was on an island environed every way with the sea, no land to be seen, except some rocks which lay a great way off, and two small islands less than this, which lay about three leagues to the west. I found also that the island I was in was barren, 
and, as I saw good reason to believe, uninhabited, except by wild beasts, of whom, however, I saw none. Yet I saw abundance of fowls, but knew not their kinds. Neither, when I killed them, could I tell what was fit for food and what was not. At my coming back, I shot at a great bird, which I saw sitting upon a tree on the side of a great wood. I believe it was the first gun that had been fired there since the creation of the world. I had no sooner fired, but from all the parts of the wood there arose an innumerable number of fowls of many sorts, making a confused screaming and crying every one according to his usual note, but not one of them of any kind that I knew. As for the creature I killed, I took it to be a kind of a hawk, its colour and beak resembling it, but it had no talons or claws more than common. Its flesh was carrion and fit for nothing. Contented with this discovery, I came back to my raft and fell to work to bring my cargo on shore, which took me up the rest of that day. And what to do with myself at night I knew not, nor indeed where to rest, for I was afraid to lie down on the ground, not knowing but some wild beast might devour me. However, as well as I could, I barricaded myself round with the chests and boards that I had brought on shore, and made a kind of a hut for that night's lodging. As for food, I yet saw not which way to supply myself, except that I'd seen two or three creatures like hares run out of the wood where I shot the fowl. I now began to consider that I might yet get a great many things out of the ship which would be useful to me, and particularly some of the rigging and sails and such other things as might come to land, and I resolved to make another voyage on board the vessel, if possible. And as I knew that the first storm that blew must necessarily break her all in pieces, I resolved to set all other things apart till I got everything out of the ship that I could get. Crusoe made a lot of trips to the ship and brought back many things. Carpenter's stores, a grindstone, muskets, powder and shot, clothing and bedding, rigging, canvas, cables, barrels of rum, and a barrel of flour, and even some bags of coins. But 13 days later, there was a big storm, and when Crusoe looked out to sea next morning, the ship had gone. I now gave over any more thoughts of the ship, or of anything out of her, except what might drive on shore from her wreck, as indeed divers pieces of her afterwards did, but those things were of small use to me. My thoughts were now wholly employed about securing myself against either savages, if any should appear, or wild beasts, if any were in the island. And I had many thoughts of the method how to do this, and what kind of dwelling to make, whether I should make me a cave in the earth, or a tent upon the earth. And in short, I resolved upon both, the manner and description of which it may not be improper to give an account of. I soon found the place I was in was not for my settlement particularly because it was upon a low, moorish ground near the sea, and I believed would not be wholesome, and more particularly because there was no fresh water near it. So I resolved to find a more healthy and more convenient spot of ground. I consulted several things in my situation, which I found would be proper for me. First, health and fresh water, I just now mentioned. Secondly, shelter from the heat of the sun. Thirdly, security from ravenous creatures, whether men or beasts. Fourthly, a view to the sea, that if God sent any ship in sight, I might not lose any advantage for my deliverance, of which I was not willing to banish all my expectation yet. In search of a place proper for this, I found a little plain on the side of a rising hill, whose front towards this little plain was steep as a house side, so that nothing could come down upon me from the top. On the side of this rock, there was a hollow place, worn a little way in, like the entrance or door of a cave. But there was not really any cave or way into the rock at all. On the flat of the green, just before this hollow place, I resolved to pitch my tent. This plain was not above a hundred yards broad, and about twice as long, and lay like a green before my door, and at the end of it descended irregularly every way down into the low grounds by the seaside. Before I set up my tent, I drew a half circle before the hollow place, which took in about ten yards in its semi-diameter from the rock. In this half circle, 
I pitched two rows of strong stakes, driving them into the ground till they stood very firm, like piles, the biggest end being out of the ground about five feet and a half and sharpened on the top. The two rows did not stand about six inches from one another. Then I took the pieces of cable which I had cut in the ship and laid them in rows, one upon another, within the circle, between these two rows of stakes, up to the top, placing other stakes in the inside, leaning against them, about two feet and a half high, like a spur to a post. And this fence was so strong that neither man or beast could get into it or over it. The entrance into this place I made to be not by a door, but by a short ladder to go over the top, which ladder, when I was in, I lifted over after me. And so I was completely fenced in and fortified, as I thought, from all the world, and consequently slept secure in the night, which otherwise I could not have done, though, as it appeared afterward, there was no need of all this caution from the enemies that I apprehended danger from. Into this fence or fortress, with infinite labour, I carried all my riches, all my provisions, ammunition and stores, and I made me a large tent, which, to preserve me from the rains, that in one part of the year are very violent there, I made double, one smaller tent within and one larger tent above it, and covered the uppermost with a large tarpaulin, which I had saved among the sails. And now I lay no more for a while in the bed, which I had brought on shore, but in a hammock, which was indeed a very good one, and belonged to the mate of the ship. Into this tent I brought all my provisions, and everything that would spoil by the wet. And having thus enclosed all my goods, I made up the entrance, which till now I had left open, and so passed and repassed, as I said, by a short ladder. When I had done this, I began to work my way into the rock, and bringing all the earth and stones that I dug out through my tent, I laid them up within my fence in the nature of a terrace, so that it raised the ground within about a foot and a half. And thus I made me a cave just behind my tent, which served me like a cellar to my house. In the interval of time while this was doing, I went out once at least every day with my gun, as well to divert myself as to see if I could kill anything fit for food and as near as I could to acquaint myself with what the island produced. The first time I went out, I presently discovered that there were goats in the island, which was a great satisfaction to me. But then it was attended with this misfortune to me, that they were so shy, so subtle and so swift of foot, that it was the difficultest thing in the world to come at them. But I was not discouraged at this, not doubting but I might now and then shoot one, as it soon happened. For after I had found their haunts a little, I laid wait in this manner for them. I observed, if they saw me in the valleys, though they were upon the rocks, they would run away as in a terrible fright. But if they were feeding in the valleys, and I was upon the rocks, they took no notice of me. From whence I concluded that, by the position of their optics, their sight was so directed downward, that they did not readily see objects that were above them. So afterward, I took this method. I always climbed the rocks first to get above them and then had frequently a fair mark. The first shot I made among these creatures, I killed a she-goat, which had a little kid by her which she gave suck to, which grieved me heartily. But when the old one fell, the kid stood stock still by her till I came up and took her up. And not only so, but when I carried the old one with me upon my shoulders, the kid followed me quite to my enclosure, upon which I laid down the dam and took the kid in my arms, and carried it over in hopes to have bred it up tame. But it would not eat, so I was forced to kill it and eat it myself. These two supplied me with flesh a great while, for I ate sparingly and saved my provisions, my bread especially, as much as possibly I could. After I'd been there about ten or twelve days, it came into my thoughts that I should lose my reckoning of time for want of books and pen and ink, and should even forget the Sabbath days from the working days. But to prevent this, I cut it with my knife upon a large post in capital letters, and making it into a great cross, I set it upon the shore where I first landed, to say, I came on shore here on the 30th of September, 
1659. Upon the sides of this square post, I cut every day a notch with my knife, and every seventh notch was as long again as the rest, and every first day of the month as long again as that long one. And thus I kept my calendar of weekly, monthly, and yearly reckoning of time. Among the many things which I brought out of the ship, I got several things of less value, but not all less useful to me, which I omitted setting down before, as in particular pens, ink and paper, several parcels in the captain's, mates, gunners and carpenters' keeping, three or four compasses, some mathematical instruments, dials, perspectives, charts and books of navigation, all of which I huddled together whether I might want them or no. Also I found three very good Bibles, which came to me in my cargo from England, and which I'd packed up among my things. Some Portuguese books also, and among them two or three Popish prayer books, and several other books, all which I carefully secured. And I must not forget that we had in the ship a dog and two cats, for I carried both the cats with me. And as for the dog, he jumped out of the ship of himself and swam on shore to me the day after I went on shore with my first cargo and was a trusty servant to me many years. I wanted nothing that he could fetch me, nor any company that he could make up to me. I only wanted to have him talk to me, but that would not do. As I observed before, I found pen, ink and paper, and I husbanded them to the utmost. And I shall show that while my ink lasted, I kept things very exact. But after that was gone, I could not, for I could not make any ink by any means that I could devise. And this put me in mind that I wanted many things, notwithstanding all that I had amassed together. And of these, this of ink was one, as also spade, pickaxe and shovel to dig or remove the earth, needles, pins and thread. As for linen, I soon learned to want that without much difficulty. This want of tools made every work I did go on heavily. And it was near a whole year before I had entirely finished my little pale or surrounded habitation. The piles or stakes, which were as heavy as I could well lift, were a long time in cutting and preparing in the woods, and more by far in bringing home. <laughs> but what need I have been concerned at the tediousness of anything I had to do, seeing I had time enough to do it in? Nor had I any other employment, if that had been over, at least that I could foresee, except the ranging the island to seek for food, which I did more or less every day. I now began to consider seriously my condition and the circumstance I was reduced to. And I drew up the state of my affairs in writing, not so much to leave them to any that were to come after me, for I was like to have but few heirs, as to deliver my thoughts from daily poring upon them and afflicting my mind. And as my reason began now to master my despondency, I began to comfort myself as well as I could, and to set the good against the evil, that I might have something to distinguish my case from worse. And I stated it, very impartially, like debtor and creditor, the comforts I enjoyed against the miseries I suffered. Thus, evil. I am cast upon a horrible, desolate island, void of all hope of recovery. Good, but I am alive and not drowned as all my ship's company was. Evil, I am divided from mankind, a solitaire, one banished from human society. Good, but I am not starved and perishing on a barren place, affording no sustenance. Evil, I have no clothes to cover me. Good, but I am in a hot climate, where if I had clothes, I could hardly wear them. Evil, I am without any defence or means to resist any violence of man or beast. Good, but I am cast on an island where I see no wild beasts to hurt me, as I saw on the coast of Africa. And what if I'd been shipwrecked there? Evil, I have no soul to speak to or to relieve me. Good, but God wonderfully sent the ship in near enough to the shore that I have gotten out so many necessary things as will either supply my wants or enable me to supply myself, even as long as I live. Crusoe continued to work hard, shopping.
chopping down trees, making furniture and shelves, improving his home and hunting. The rainy season came and went. For more than a week the next summer, he lay very ill with a fever, but gradually he recovered. He read the Bible for comfort. Then, feeling stronger after his illness, he began to explore his island kingdom. It was the 15th of July that I began to take a more particular survey of the island itself. I went up the creek first where I brought my rafts on shore. I found, after I came about two miles up, that the tide did not flow any higher and that it was no more than a little brook of running water and very fresh and good. On the bank of this brook I found many pleasant savannas or meadows, plain, smooth and covered with grass. The next day, the 16th, I went up the same way again, and after going something farther than I'd gone the day before, I found the brook and the savannas began to cease and the country became more woody than before. In this part I found different fruits, and particularly I found melons upon the ground in great abundance, and grapes upon the trees. The vines had spread indeed over the trees, and the clusters of grapes were just now in their prime, very ripe and rich. This was a surprising discovery, and I was exceeding glad of them, but I was warned by my experience to eat sparingly of them, remembering that when I was ashore in Barbary, the eating of grapes killed several of our Englishmen, who were slaves there, by throwing them into fluxes and fevers. But I found an excellent use for these grapes, and that was to cure or dry them in the sun, and keep them as dried grapes or raisins are kept, which I thought would be, as indeed they were, as wholesome as agreeable to eat, when no grapes might be to be had. I spent all that evening there, and went not back to my habitation, which, by the way, was the first night, as I might say, I had lain from home. In the night, I took my first contrivance and got up into a tree, where I slept well, and the next morning proceeded upon my discovery, travelling near four miles, as I might judge, by the length of the valley, keeping still due north, with a ridge of hills on the south and north side of me. At the end of this march, I came to an opening where the country seemed to descend to the west, and a little spring of fresh water, which issued out of the side of the hill by me, ran the other way, that is, due east, and the country appeared so fresh, so green, so flourishing, everything being in a constant verdure or flourish of spring, that it looked like a planted garden. I descended a little on the side of that delicious vale, surveying it with a secret kind of pleasure though mixed with my other afflicting thoughts, to think that this was all my own, that I was king and lord of all this country indefeasibly, and had a right of possession, and if I could convey it, I might have it in inheritance as completely as any lord of a manor in England. I saw here abundance of cocoa trees, orange and lemon and citron trees, but all wild and very few bearing fruits, at least not then, However, the green limes that I gathered were not only pleasant to eat, but very wholesome, and I mixed their juice afterwards with water, which made it very wholesome and very cool and refreshing. Robinson Crusoe made another home here, which he called his country house. He planted crops, barley and rice, he caught a parrot, which he called Paul, and taught it to say his name. He had now started the second year of his stay on the island, and he began to explore it more thoroughly. In this journey, my dog surprised a young kid and seized upon it, and I, running in to take hold of it, caught it and saved it alive from the dog. I had a great mind to bring it home if I could, for I had often been musing whether it might not be possible to get a kid or two and so raise a breed of tame goats, which might supply me when my powder and shot should be all spent. I made a collar to this little creature, and with a string, which I made of some rope yarn, which I always carried about me, I led him along, though with some difficulty, till I came to my bower. And there I enclosed him and left him, for I was very impatient to be at home, from whence I had been absent above a month. I cannot express what a satisfaction it was to me to come into my old hutch and lie down in my hammock bed. 
this little wandering journey without settled place of abode had been so unpleasant to me that my own house, as I called it to myself, was a perfect settlement to me compared to that. And it rendered everything about me so comfortable that I resolved I would never go a great way from it again while it should be my lot to stay on the island. I reposed myself here a week to rest and regale myself after my long journey, during which most of the time was taken up in the weighty affair of making a cage for my poll, who began now to be a mere domestic and to be mighty well acquainted with me. Then I began to think of the poor kid which I had penned in within my little circle and resolved to go and fetch it home or to give it some food. Accordingly, I went and found it where I left it, for indeed it could not get out, but almost starved for want of food. I went and cut boughs of trees and branches of such shrubs as I could find and threw it over, and having fed it, I tied it as I did before to lead it away. But it was so tame with being hungry that I had no need to have tied it, for it followed me like a dog. And as I continually fed it, the creature became so loving, so gentle and so fond, that it became from that time one of my domestics also, and would never leave me afterwards. The rainy season of the autumnal equinox was now come, and I kept the 30th of September in the same solemn manner as before, being the anniversary of my landing on the island, having now been there two years, and no more prospect of being delivered than the first day I came there. I spent the whole day in humble and thankful acknowledgments of the many wonderful mercies which my solitary condition was attended with, and without which it might have been infinitely more miserable. It was now that I began sensibly to feel how much more happy this life I now led was, with all its miserable circumstances, than the wicked, cursed, abominable life I led all the past part of my day. And now I changed both my sorrows and my joys. My very desires altered, my affections changed their gusts, and my delights were perfectly new from what they were at my first coming, or indeed for the two years past. So the long years passed. Crusoe continuously busy at the simple but hard task of keeping himself alive and comfortable. He learns how to make his own pots and his own clothes, he even makes himself an umbrella, and he builds a crude boat. Eighteen years go by, and during all this time he's quite alone, with no human companionship or contact, without even any sign of other human life on his island. It happened one day about noon going towards my boat. I was exceedingly surprised with the print of a man's naked foot on the shore, which was very plain to be seen in the sand. I stood like one thunderstruck, or as if I had seen an apparition. I listened, I looked round me, I could hear nothing or see anything. I went up to a rising ground to look farther. I went up the shore and down the shore, but it was all one. I could see no other impression but that one. I went to it again to see if there were any more, and to observe if it might not be my fancy. But there was no room for that, for there was exactly the very print of a foot, toes, heel, and every part of a foot. How it came thither I knew not, nor could in the least imagine. But after innumerable fluttering thoughts, like a man perfectly confused and out of myself, I came home to my fortification, not feeling, as we say, the ground I went on, but terrified to the last degree, looking behind me at every two or three steps, mistaking every bush and tree, and fancying every stump at a distance to be a man. Nor is it possible to describe how many various shapes a frighted imagination represented things to me in, how many wild ideas were found every moment in my fancy, and what strange, unaccountable whimsies came into my thoughts by the way. I slept none that night.
Terrified, Crusoe spent many weeks strengthening the defenses of his home. All the time, he wondered about that footprint, whose it was and how it came to be there. Another two years go by, and on one of his journeys of exploration, he finds more evidence that his island is not as lonely as he thought. When I was come down the hill to the shore, being the southwest point of the island, I was perfectly confounded and amazed. Nor is it possible for me to express the horror of my mind at seeing the shore spread with skulls, hands, feet and other bones of human bodies. And particularly, I observed a place where there had been a fire made and a circle dug in the earth like a cockpit where it is supposed the savage wretches had sat down to their inhuman feastings upon the bodies of their fellow creatures. I was so astonished with the sight of these things that I entertained no notion of any danger to myself from it for a long while. All my apprehensions were buried in the thoughts of such a pitch of inhuman hellish brutality and the horror of the degeneracy of human nature which, though I had heard of often, yet I never had so near a view of before. I turned away my face from the horrid spectacle. In short, I got me up the hill again with all the speed I could and walked on towards my own habitation. When I came a little out of that part of the island, I stood still a while as amazed. And then, recovering myself, I looked up with the utmost affection of my soul and with a flood of tears in my eyes, gave God thanks that had cast my first lot in a part of the world where I was distinguished from such dreadful creatures as these. In this frame of thankfulness, I went home to my castle and began to be much easier now as to the safety of my circumstances than ever I was before. For I observed that these wretches never came to this island in search of what they could get, perhaps not seeking, not wanting or not expecting anything here, and having often, no doubt, been up in the covered, woody part of it without finding anything to their purpose. Yet I entertained such an abhorrence of the savage wretches that I've been speaking of, and of the wretched, inhuman custom of their devouring and eating one another up, that I continued pensive and sad and continued close within my own circle for almost two years after this. For the aversion which nature gave me to these hellish wretches was such that I was fearful of seeing them as of seeing the devil himself. After he came across the remains of the cannibal feast, Crusoe spent three more years before he again found signs of the visitors. It was now the month of December in my 23rd year on the island. And this being the southern solstice, for winter I cannot call it, was the particular time of my harvest and required my being pretty much abroad in the fields. When going out pretty early in the morning, even before it was thorough daylight, I was surprised with seeing a light of some fire upon the shore, at a distance from me of about two miles, towards the end of the island, where I had observed some savages had been as before. But not on the other side. But to my great affliction, it was on my side of the island. I was indeed terribly surprised at the sight, and stopped short within my grove, not daring to go out. And yet I had no more peace within, from the apprehensions I had that if these savages, in rambling over the island, should find my corn, standing or cut, or any of my works and improvements, they would immediately conclude that there were people in the place, and would then never give over till they had found me out. In this extremity, I went back directly to my castle, pulled up the ladder after me, and made all things without look as wild and natural as I could. Then I prepared myself within, putting myself in a posture of defence, I loaded all my cannon, as I called them, that is to say my muskets, which were mounted upon my new fortification, 
and all my pistols, and resolved to defend myself to the last gasp, not forgetting seriously to commend myself to the divine protection, and earnestly to pray to God to deliver me out of the hands of the barbarians. And in this posture I continued about two hours, but began to be mighty impatient for intelligence abroad, for I had no spies to send out. After sitting a while longer, and musing what I should do in this case, I was not able to bear sitting in ignorance any longer. So, setting up my ladder to the side of the hill where there was a flat place, as I observed before, and then pulling the ladder up after me, I set it up again and mounted to the top of the hill. And pulling out my perspective glass, which I had taken on purpose, I laid me down flat on my belly on the ground and began to look for the place. I presently found there was no less than nine naked savages sitting round a small fire they had made, not to warm them, for they had no need of that, the weather being extreme hot, but, as I supposed, to dress some of their barbarous diet of human flesh which they had brought with them. Whether alive or dead, I could not know. They had two canoes with them, which they had hauled up upon the shore, and as it was then tide of ebb, they seemed to me to wait for the return of the flood to go away again. It is not easy to imagine what confusion this sight put me into, especially seeing them come to my side of the island, and so near me too. But when I observed their coming must be always with the current of the ebb, I began afterwards to be more sedate in my mind, being satisfied that I might go abroad with safety all the time of the tide of flood if they were not on shore before. And having made this observation, I went abroad about my harvest work with more composure. As I expected, so it proved. For as soon as the tide made to the westward, I saw them all take boat and row all away. I should have observed that for an hour and more before they went off, they went to dancing, and I could easily discern their postures and gestures by my glasses. As soon as I saw them, shipped and gone, I took two guns upon my shoulders, and two pistols at my girdle, and my great sword by my side, without a scabbard, and with all the speed I was able to make, I went away to the hill where I had discovered the first appearance of all. And as soon as I got thither, which was not less than two hours, for I could not go apace, being so loaden with arms as I was, I perceived that there had been three canoes more of savages on that place, and looking out farther, I saw they were all at sea together, making over for the main. This was a dreadful sight to me, especially when, going down to the shore, I could see the marks of horror which the dismal work they had been about had left behind it, the blood, the bones, and part of the flesh of human bodies, eaten and devoured by those wretches with merriment and sport. I was so filled with indignation at the sight that I began now to premeditate the destruction of the next that I saw there. Let them be who or how many soever. Many more months go by before Crusoe's next encounter with the cannibals. And this time... It was a much closer one. I was surprised one morning early with seeing no less than five canoes all on shore together on my side of the island, and the people who belonged to them all landed and out of my sight. The number of them broke all my measures, for seeing so many and knowing that they always came four or six or sometimes more in a boat, I could not tell what to think of it, or how to take my measures to attack twenty or thirty men single-handed. So I lay still in my castle, perplexed and discomforted. However, I put myself into all the same postures for an attack that I had formerly provided, and was just ready for action if anything had presented. Having waited a good while, listening to hear if they made any noise, at length, being very impatient, I set my guns at the foot of my ladder and clambered up to the top of the hill by my two stages as usual. Standing so, however, that my head did not appear above the hill, so that they could not perceive me by any means. Here I observed, by the help of my perspective glass, 
that they were no less than 30 in number, that they had a fire kindled, that they had had meat dressed. How they cooked it, that I knew not, or what it was. But they were all dancing in I know not how many barbarous gestures and figures, their own way, round the fire. While I was thus looking on them, I perceived by my perspective two miserable wretches dragged from the boats where it seems they were laid by and were now brought out for the slaughter. I perceived one of them immediately fell, being knocked down, I suppose, with a club or wooden sword, for that was their way, and two or three others were at work immediately, cutting him open for their cookery, while the other victim was left standing by himself till they should be ready for him. In that very moment, this poor wretch, seeing himself a little at liberty, nature inspired him with hopes of life, and he started away from them and ran with incredible swiftness along the sands directly towards me. I mean towards that part of the coast where my habitation was. I was dreadfully frighted, that I must acknowledge, when I perceived him to run my way, and especially when, as I thought, I saw him pursued by the whole body. However, I kept my station, and my spirits began to recover when I found that there was not above three men that followed him. And still more was I encouraged when I found that he outstripped them exceedingly in running and gained ground off them, so that if he could but hold it for half an hour, I saw easily he would fairly get away from them all. There was between them and my castle a creek, and this I saw plainly he must necessarily swim over, or the poor wretch would be taken there. But when the savage escaping came thither, he made nothing of it, though the tide was then up, but plunging in, swam through in about thirty strokes or thereabouts, landed, and ran on with exceeding strength and swiftness. When the three persons came to the creek, I found that two of them could swim, but the third could not, and that, standing on the other side, he looked at the other, but went no further, and soon after went softly back, which, as it happed, was very well for him in the main. I observed that the two who swam were yet more than twice as long swimming over the creek as the fellow was that fled from them. It came now very warmly upon my thoughts, and indeed irresistibly, that now was my time to get me a servant and perhaps a companion or assistant, and that I was called plainly by providence to save this poor creature's life. I immediately ran down the ladders with all possible expedition, fetched my two guns, for they were both but at the foot of the ladders, as I observed above, and getting up again with the same haste to the top of the hill, I crossed towards the sea, and having a very short cut and all downhill, clapped myself in the way between the pursuers and the pursued, hallooing aloud to him that fled, who, looking back, was at first perhaps as much frighted at me as at them, but I beckoned with my hand to him to come back, and in the meantime I slowly advanced towards the two that followed. Then, rushing at once upon the foremost, I knocked him down with the stock of my piece. I was loath to fire, because I would not have the rest here, though at that distance it would not have been easily heard, and being out of sight of the smoke, too, they would not easily have known what to make of it. Having knocked this fellow down, the other who pursued with him stopped, as if he'd been frighted, and I advanced a pace towards him. But as I came nearer, I perceived presently he had a bow and arrow, and was fitting it to shoot at me. So I was then necessitated to shoot at him first, which I did, and killed him at the first shot. The poor savage who fled, but had stopped, though he saw both his enemies fallen and killed, as he thought, yet was so frighted with the fire and noise of my piece, that he stood stock still, and neither came forward or went backward, though he seemed rather inclined to fly still than to come on. I hallooed again to him and made signs to come forward, which he easily understood and came a little way, then stopped again and then a little further and, and stopped again. And I could then perceive that he stood trembling as if he'd been taken prisoner and had just been to be killed as his two enemies were. I beckoned him again to come to me, and gave him all the signs of encouragement that I could think of, and he came nearer and nearer, kneeling down every ten or twelve steps, in token of acknowledgement for my saving his life. I smiled at him, and looked pleasantly, 
and beckoned to him to come still nearer. At length, he came close to me, and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground, and laid his head upon the ground, and, taking me by the foot, set my foot upon his head. This, it seems, was in token of swearing to be my slave forever. I took him up and made much of him and encouraged him all I could. But there was more work to do yet, for I perceived the savage whom I knocked down was not killed but stunned with the blow and began to come to himself. So I pointed to him and showing him the savage that he was not dead, upon this he spoke some words to me, though I could not understand them. Yet I thought they were pleasant to hear, for they were the first sound of a man's voice that I'd heard, my own accepted, for above twenty-five years. But there was no time for such reflections now. The savage, who was knocked down, recovered himself so far as to sit up upon the ground, and I perceived that my savage began to be afraid. But when I saw that, I presented my other piece at the man, as if I would shoot him. Upon this, my savage for so I call him now, made a motion to me to lend him my sword, which hung naked in a belt by my side. So I did. He no sooner had it, but he runs to his enemy, and at one blow cut off his head as cleverly no executioner in Germany could have done it sooner or better, which I thought very strange for one who, I had reason to believe, never saw a sword in his life before, except their own wooden swords. However, it seems, as I learned afterwards, they make their wooden sword so sharp, so heavy, and the wood is so hard, that they will cut off heads even with them, eye and arms, and that at one blow, too. When he had done this, he comes laughing to me in sign of triumph, and brought me the sword again, and with abundance of gestures, which I did not understand, laid it down with the head of the savage that he had killed just before me. But that which astonished him most was to know how I had killed the other Indian so far off. So, pointing to him, he made signs to me to let him go to him. So I, I bade him go as well as I could. When he came to him, he stood like one amazed, looking at him, turned him first on one side, then on t'other, looked at the wound the bullet had made, which it seems was just in his breast, where it had made a hole and no great quantity of blood had followed, but he had bled inwardly, for he was quite dead. He took up his bow and arrows and came back. So I turned to go away and beckoned to him to follow me, making signs to him that more might come after them. Upon this he signed to me that he should bury them with sand, that they might not be seen by the rest if they followed. And so I made signs again to him to do so. He fell to work, and in an instant he had scraped a hole in the sand with his hands big enough to bury the first in, and then dragged him into it and covered him, and did so also by the other. I believe he had buried them both in a quarter of an hour. Then, calling him away, I carried him, not to my castle, but quite away to my cave on the farther part of the island. Here I gave him bread and a bunch of raisins to eat, and a draught of water, which I found he was indeed in great distress for by his running. And having refreshed him, I made signs for him to go lie down and sleep, pointing to a place where I had laid a great parcel of rice straw and a blanket upon it, which I used to sleep upon myself sometimes. So the poor creature laid down and went to sleep. He was a comely, handsome fellow, perfectly well made, with straight, strong limbs, not too large, tall and well shaped, and as I reckon about twenty-six years of age. He had a very good countenance, not a fierce and surly aspect, but seemed to have something very manly in his face. After he had slumbered, rather than slept about half an hour, he waked again and comes out of the cave to me, for I had been milking my goats which I had in the enclosure just by. When he espied me, he came running to me, 
laying himself down again upon the ground with all the possible signs of an humble, thankful disposition, making a many antic gestures to show it. At last, he lays his head flat upon the ground, close to my foot, and sets my other foot upon his head as he had done before, and after this made all the signs to me of subjection, servitude, and submission imaginable to let me know how he would serve me as long as he lived. I understood him in many things, and let him know I was very well pleased with him. In a little time I began to speak to him, and teach him to speak to me. And first, I made him know his name should be Friday, which was the day I saved his life. I called him so for the memory of the time. I likewise taught him to say, Master, and then let him know that that was to be my name. I likewise taught him to say, Yes, and No, and to know the meaning of them. I gave him some milk in an earthen pot and let him see me drink it before him and sop my bread in it. And I gave him a cake of bread to do the like, which he quickly complied with, and made signs that it was very good for him. was greatly delighted with my new companion and made it my business to teach him everything that was proper to make him useful, handy and helpful, but especially to make him speak and understand me when I spake. And he was the aptest scholar that ever was, and particularly was so merry, so constantly diligent and so pleased when he could but understand me or make me understand him that it was very pleasant to me to talk to him. And now my life began to be so easy that I began to say to myself that could I but have been safe from more savages, I cared not if I was never to remove from the place while I lived. After I had been two or three days returned to my castle, I thought that in order to bring Friday off from his horrid way of feeding and from the relish of a cannibal's stomach, I ought to let him taste other flesh. So I took him out with me one morning to the woods. I went indeed, intending to kill a kid out of my own flock and bring him home and dress it. But as I was going, I saw a she-goat lying down in the shade and two young kids sitting by her. I catched hold of Friday. Hold, says I, stand still, and made signs to him not to stir. Immediately I presented my piece, shot and killed one of the kids. The poor creature, who had at a distance indeed seen me kill the savage, his enemy, but did not know or could imagine how it was done, was sensibly surprised, trembled and shook and looked so amazed that I thought he would have sunk down. He did not see the kid I had shot at or perceive I had killed it, but ripped up his waistcoat to feel if he was not wounded, and as I found presently, thought I was resolved to kill him. For he came and kneeled down to me, and embracing my knees, said a great many things I did not understand, but I could easily see that the meaning was to pray to me not to kill him. I soon found a way to convince him that I would do him no harm, and taking him up by the hand, laughed at him, and pointing to the kid which I had killed, beckoned to him to run and fetch it, which he did. And while he was wondering and looking to see how the creature was killed, I loaded my gun again, and by and by I saw a great fowl, like a hawk, sit upon a tree within shot. So, to let Friday understand a little what I would do, I called him to me again, pointing at the fowl, which was indeed a parrot, though I thought it had been a hawk, I say, pointing to the parrot and to my gun, and to the ground under the parrot, to let him see I would make it fall, I made him understand that I would shoot and kill that bird. Accordingly, I fired and bade him look, and immediately he saw the parrot fall. He stood like one frighted again, notwithstanding all I had said to him, and I found he was the more amazed because he did not see me put anything into the gun, but thought that there must be some wonderful 
fund of death and destruction in that thing, able to kill man, beast, bird, or anything near or far off. And the astonishment this created in him was such as could not wear off for a long time. And I believe, if I would have let him, he would have worshipped me and my gun. As for the gun itself, he would not so much as touch it for several days after, but would speak to it and talk to it, as if it had answered him when he was by himself, which, as I afterwards learned of him, was to desire it not to kill him. This was the pleasantest year of all the life I led in this place. Friday began to talk pretty well and understand the names of almost everything I had occasion to call for and of every place I had to send him to and talk a great deal to me. So that in short I began now to have some use for my tongue again, which indeed I had very little occasion for before, that is to say about speech. Besides the pleasure of talking to him, I had a singular satisfaction in the fellow himself. His simple, unfeigned honesty appeared to me more and more every day, and I began really to love the creature. And on his side, I believe, he loved me more than it was possible for him ever to love anything before. I had a mind once to try if he had any hankering inclination to his own country again, and having learned him English so well that he could answer me almost any questions, I asked him whether the nation that he belonged to never conquered in battle, at which he smiled and said, oh, Yes, yes, we always fight the better. Uh, that is, he meant, always get the better in fight. And so we began the following discourse. You always fight the better, said I. How came you to be taken prisoner then, Friday? My nation beat much for all that. How beat? If your nation beat them... How came you to be taken? They more many than my nation in the place where me was. They take one, two, three, and me. My nation overbeat them in the yonder place where me no was. There my nation take one, two, great thousand. But why did not your side recover you from the hands of your enemies then? Oh, they run one, two, three, and me, and may go in the canoe. My nation have no canoe that time. Well, Friday, and what does your nation do with the men they take? Do they carry them away and eat them as these did? Oh, yes, my nation eats man's too, eat all up. Where do they carry them? Go to other place where they think. Do they come hither? Oh, yes, yes, they come hither, come other else place. Have you been here with them? Yes, I've been here. So teaches Man Friday about the Christian God and the evils of cannibalism. Together they build a good big boat and they learn to sail it. They get on very well. Then one morning, on Crusoe's 28th year on the island, Friday wakes him up with the news that there's a ship lying at anchor offshore and one of the ship's boats is coming in to land nearby. I cannot express the confusion I was in. Though the joy of seeing a ship, and one who I had reason to believe was manned by my own countrymen and consequently friends, was such as I cannot describe. But yet, I had some secret doubts hung about me. I cannot tell from whence they came, bidding me keep upon my guard. In the first place, it occurred to me to consider what business an English ship could have in that part of the world since it was not the way to or from any part of the world where the English had any traffic, and I knew there had been no storms to drive them in there as in distress, and that if they were English really, 
it was most probable that they were here upon no good design, and that I had better continue as I was than fall into the hands of thieves and murderers. I had not kept myself long in this posture, but I saw the boat draw near upon the shore, as if they looked for a creek to thrust in at for the convenience of landing. However, as they did not come quite far enough, they did not see the little inlet where I formerly landed my rafts, but run their boat on shore upon the beach at about half a mile from me, which was very happy for me, for otherwise they would have landed just as I may say at my door, and would soon have beaten me out of my castle and perhaps have plundered me of all I had. When they were on shore, I was fully satisfied that they were Englishmen, at least most of them, one or two I thought were Dutch, but it did not prove so. There were in all eleven men, whereof three of them I found were unarmed, and as I thought, bound. And when the first four or five of them were jumped on shore, they took those three out of the boat as prisoners. One of the three I could perceive using the most passionate gestures of entreaty, affliction and despair, even to a kind of extravagance. And the other two, I could perceive, lifted up their hands sometimes and appeared concerned indeed, but not to such a degree as the first. I was perfectly confounded at the sight, and knew not what the meaning of it should be. Friday called out to me in English, as well as he could, Oh, master, you see Englishmans eat prisoner as well as savage mans. Why, says I, Friday, do you think they are going to eat them then? Oh, yes, says Friday, they will eat them. No, no, says I, Friday, I am afraid they will murder them indeed, but you may be sure they will not eat them. <laughs> Crusoe waits until the sailors have dispersed inland. The three prisoners are left huddled unhappily by the beach. I came as near them undiscovered as I could, and then before any of them saw me, I called aloud to them in Spanish, What are ye, gentlemen? They started up at the noise, but were ten times more confounded when they saw me and the uncouth figure that I made. They made no answer at all, but I thought I perceived them just going to fly from me when I spoke to them in English. Gentlemen, said I, do not be surprised at me. Perhaps you may have a friend near you when you did not expect it. He must be sent directly from heaven then, said one of them very gravely to me and pulling off his hat at the same time to me. For our condition is past the help of man. All help is from heaven, sir, said I. But can you put a stranger in the way how to help you? For you seem to me to be in some great distress. I saw you when you landed, and when you seemed to make applications to the brutes that came with you, I saw one of them lift up his sword to kill you. The poor man, with tears running down his face and trembling, looking like one astonished, returned, Am I talking to God or man? Is it a real man or an angel? Be in no fear about that, sir, said I. If God had sent an angel to relieve you, he would have come better clothed and armed after another manner than you see me in. Pray lay aside your fears. I am a man, an Englishman, and disposed to assist you, you see. I have one servant only. We have arms and ammunition. Tell us freely, can we serve you? What is your case? Our case, said he. Our case, sir, is too long to tell you while our murderers are so near. But in short, sir, I was commander of that ship. My men have mutinied against me. They've been hardly prevailed on not to murder me. At last have set me on shore in this desolate place with these two men with me, one my mate, t'other a passenger, where we expected to perish, believing the place to be uninhabited, and know not yet what to think of it. Where are those brutes, your enemies, said I? You know where they've gone? Ah, there they lie, sir, said he, pointing to a thicket of trees. My heart trembles for fear they've seen us and heard you speak. If they have, they will certainly murder us all. Have they any firearms, said I? 
He answered, they had only two pieces and one which they left in the boat. Well then, said I, leave the rest to me. I see they're all asleep. It is an easy thing to kill them all. But shall we rather take them prisoners? He told me there were two desperate villains among them that it was scarce safe to show any mercy to. But if they were secured, he believed all the rest would return to their duty. I asked him which they were. He told me he could not at that distance describe them, but he would obey my orders in anything I would direct. Well, said I, let us retreat out of their view or hearing, lest they awake, and we will resolve further. So they willingly went back with me till the woods covered us from them. Look you, sir, said I, if I venture upon your deliverance, are you willing to make two conditions with me? He anticipated my proposals by telling me that both he and the ship, if recovered, would be wholly directed and commanded by me in everything. And if the ship was not recovered, he would live and die with me in what part of the world soever I would send him. And the two other men said the same. Well, says I, my conditions are but two. One, that while you stay on this island with me, you will not pretend to any authority here. And if I put arms into your hands, you will, upon all occasions, give them up to me and do no prejudice to me or mine upon this island. And in the meantime, be governed by my orders. Two, that if the ship is or may be recovered, you will carry me and my man to England, passage free. He gave me all the assurances that the invention and faith of man could devise, that he would comply with these most reasonable demands, and besides would owe his life to me and acknowledge it upon all occasions as long as he lived. Well then, says I, here are three muskets for you, with powder and ball. Tell me next what you think is proper to be done. He showed all the testimony of his gratitude that he was able, but offered to be wholly guided by me. I told him I thought it was hard venturing anything, but the best method I could think of was to fire upon them at once as they lay. And if any was not killed at the first volley and offered to submit, we might save them and so put it wholly upon God's providence to direct the shot. He said very modestly that he was loath to kill them if he could help it, but that those two were incorrigible villains and had been the authors of all the mutiny in the ship and if they escaped, we should be undone still. For they would go on board and bring the whole ship's company and destroy us all. Well then, says I, necessity legitimates my advice, for it is the only way to save our lives. However, seeing him still cautious of shedding blood, I told him they should go themselves and manage as they found convenient. In the middle of this discourse, we heard some of them awake, and soon after we saw two of them on their feet, I asked him if either of them were of the men who he had said were the heads of the mutiny. He said, no. Well then, said I, you may let them escape, and Providence seems to have wakened them on purpose to save themselves. No, says I, if the rest escape you, it is your fault. Animated with this, he took the musket I had given him in his hand, and the pistol in his belt, and his two comrades with him, with each man a piece in his hand. The two men who were with him going first made some noise, at which one of the seamen who was awake turned about, and seeing them coming, cried out to the rest. But it was too late then, for the moment he cried out, they fired. I mean the two men, the captain wisely reserving his own piece. They had so well aimed their shot at the men they knew that one of them was killed on the spot, and the other very much wounded. But not being dead, he started up upon his feet and called eagerly for help to the other. But the captain, stepping up to him, told him twas too late to cry for help, he should call upon God to forgive his villainy, and with that word knocked him down with a stock of his musket so that he never spoke more. There were three more in the company, and one of them was also slightly wounded. By this time I was come, and when they saw their danger and that it was in vain to resist, they begged for mercy. The captain told them he would spare their lives if they would give him any assurance of their abhorrence of the treachery they'd been guilty of, and would swear to be faithful to him in recovering the ship, and afterwards in carrying her back to Jamaica, from whence they came. They gave him all the protestations of their sincerity that could be desired, 
and he was willing to believe them and spare their lives, which I was not against. Only I obliged him to keep them bound hand and foot while they were upon the island. While this was doing, I sent Friday with the captain's mate to the boat with orders to secure her and bring away the oars and sail, which they did. And by and by, three straggling men that were, happily for them, parted from the rest, came back upon hearing the guns fired. And seeing their captain, who before was their prisoner, now their conqueror, they submitted to be bound also. And so our victory was complete. <laughs> Crusoe's victorious party recapture the ship and suppress the mutiny. The leader of the mutineers is shot dead in the fight and his five chief supporters are taken prisoner. They believe that Robinson Crusoe is the governor of the island with a considerable force of men at his command. Being all met and the captain with me, I caused the men to be brought before me and I told them I had had a full account of their villainous behaviour to the captain and how they had had run away with the ship and were preparing to commit farther robberies, but that Providence had ensnared them in their own ways, and that they were fallen into the pit which they had digged for others. I let them know that, by my direction, the ship had been seized, that she lay now in the road, and they might see by and by that their new captain had received the reward of his villainy, for that they might see him hanging at the yard arm. But as to them, I wanted to know what they had to say, why I should not execute them as pirates, taken in the fact, as by my commission they could not doubt I had authority to do. One of them answered in the name of the rest that they had nothing to say but this, that when they were taken, the captain promised them their lives, and they humbly implored my mercy. But I told them I knew not what mercy to show them, but as for myself, I had resolved to quit the island and had taken passage with the captain to go for England. And as for the captain, he could not carry them to England other than as prisoners in irons, to be tried for mutiny and running away with a ship. The consequence of which they must need to know would be the gallows, so that I could not tell which was best for them, unless they had a mind to take their fate in the island. If they desired that, I did not care, as I had liberty to leave it. I had some inclination to give them their lives if they thought they could shift on shore. They seemed very thankful for it, said they would much rather venture to stay there than to be carried to England to be hanged. So I left it on that issue. I accordingly set them at liberty and bade them retire into the woods to the place whence they came. And I would leave them some firearms, some ammunition, and some directions how they should live very well if they thought fit. Upon this I prepared to go on board the ship, but told the captain that I would stay that night to prepare my things, and desired him to go on board in the meantime and keep all right in the ship, and send the boat on shore the next day for me, ordering him in the meantime to cause the new captain, who was killed, to be hanged at the yardarm, that these men might see him. When the captain was gone, I sent for the men up to me, to my apartment, and entered seriously into discourse with them of their circumstances. I told them I thought they had made a right choice, that if the captain carried them away, they would certainly be hanged. I showed them the new captain hanging at the yard arm of the ship, and told them they had nothing less to expect. When they all declared their willingness to stay, I then told them I would let them into the story of my living there, and put them into the way of making it easy to them. Accordingly, I gave them the whole history of the place and of my coming to it, showing them my fortifications, the way I made my bread, planted my corn, cured my grapes, and, in a word, all that was necessary to make them easy. I left them my firearms, five muskets, three fowling pieces, and three swords. I had above a barrel and a half of powder left, for after the first year or two I used but little and wasted none. I gave them a description of the way I managed the goats and directions to milk and fatten them and to make both butter and cheese. In a word, I gave them every part of my own story. And I told them I would prevail with the captain to leave them two barrels of gunpowder more and some garden seeds 
which I told them I would have been very glad of. Also, I gave them the bag of peas, which the captain had brought me to eat, and bade them be sure to sow and increase them. Having done all this, I left them the next day and went on board the ship. We prepared immediately to sail, but did not weigh that night. The next morning, early, two of the five men came swimming to the ship's side and, making a most lamentable complaint of the other three, begged to be taken into the ship for God's sake, for they should be murdered and begged the captain to take them on board, though he hanged them immediately. Upon this, the captain pretended to have no power without me, but after some difficulty and after their solemn promises of amendment, they were taken on board, and were sometime after soundly whipped and pickled, after which they proved very honest and quiet fellows. Sometime after this, the boat was ordered on shore, the tide being up, with the things promised to the men, to which the captain, at my intercession, caused their chests and clothes to be added, which they took and were very thankful for. I also encouraged them by telling them that if it lay in my way to send any vessel to take them in, I would not forget them. When I took leave of this island, I carried on board for relics the great goatskin cap I had made, my umbrella, and my parrot. Also, I forgot not to take the money I formerly mentioned, which had lain by me so long useless that it was grown rusty or tarnished and could hardly pass for silver till it had been a little rubbed and handled. And thus, my man Friday accompanying me, I left the island the 19th of December, as I found by the ship's account, in the year 1686 after I had been upon it eight and twenty years, two months, and nineteen days.